thanks so much for joining us this afternoon. It's, it's really an honor and also it's a bit of a strange one because I'm sure you're used to mostly being the one who's in the interviewer seat and now you're in the interviewee seat. I might be very nervous and I might not give coherent answers, but let's give it a go. Sure. Um, I, I thought we'd start it back, all the way back from um, your, your childhood and early life. Um, so you've, you've clearly been interested in politics from an early age. I mean, you studied politics at university and you were president of your students' union. Um, I guess, how did this early interest in politics and policy making develop for you? Uh, God, that, that, that is a huge question. Um, I guess mainly because I'm a really dull human being and that I couldn't think of anything more exciting to be involved in than politics. No, that's a facetious answer. Um, I, 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 so I grew up in the East End of London. My parents were social workers. Uh, every single person at my junior school uh, lived in public housing, in council housing. And then I kind of, aged 11, I moved to Finchley, which was then Margaret Thatcher's uh, constituency and everybody owned their own housing. I thought, oh, that's kind of interesting. That's kind of very different. Um, and then when I was about 15 or 16, I kind of got in with a crowd um, who were quite political. And, um, and my girlfriend's father was in the cabinet, uh, in the Labour cabinet, in the Jim Callaghan era, when he was prime minister. And it gave me an insight into politics that I kind of not had considered because I think when you're you know when I started getting interested in politics I was interested in ideas I was interested in the ideas of you know equitable distribution or freedom or liberty or big concepts like that and then you and then you get to meet a cabinet minister and they're all interested in right who do I need to talk to how do I need to get up who do I need to make alliances with and it became much more practical and I kind of think that whether you are in student politics at Oxford, or you're Boris Johnson today, you're kind of trying to work out, how do I get things done? How do I make a difference? And I just became fascinated in, I mean, there are a lot of people who take, a, and a lot of journalists who take a really cynical view of politics and politicians. And there was a kind of American writer, H.L. Uh, Mencken, I think it was, who, who said that the relationship between a journalist and a politician ought to be the same as that between a dog and a lamppost. And I kind of thought that's fine up to a point and it's witty. But actually I'm kind of, I kind of think that politicians, for the most part, are people who are trying to make a difference, who are trying to make society better with, you know, different ideas on what better means. You know, whether it's kind of, being in Europe or being out of Europe or whatever it happens to be, but they are driven by pretty honourable ideas and ideals. Now, obviously, you make compromises because, you know, it's also about power and about how you retain power. And so those ideas of politics always fascinated me. And I kind of thought, a lot of people go, oh, you're interested in politics, glaze over. And I kind of thought, as a journalist, it would be, I want to make politics interesting. And I want to say, hey, this matters, and this is important, and this is fun for the following reasons. And so I kind of, you know, became very interested in political journalism. Um, you know, as, as you say, I was interested in politics as a student, and I became... And then I thought, do I want to be a politician? <laughs> and I really decided I didn't. And I've kind of... One of the debates I've had with myself over the years is, am I a coward? for not having gone down that route. Because I think that there, you know, as I said, I, I kind of, I, I, so I, was a, I, was a, I was a political correspondent at the end of the Thatcher era, John Major took over, and then I was stayed at Westminster until uh, Tony Blair became Prime Minister, and, and then I kind of moved abroad at the end of the 1990s. Um, and I remember one of the very experienced uh, political journalists there, Michael White from The Guardian, you know, we would sit in the press gallery and we'd look down and you'd have the leader of the opposition there and you'd have the prime minister there and you'd have the backbenchers on either side. And he said, you know, remember, you know, th this, is, this is between the Christians and the lions. We don't, we don't care. We're just spectators of the sport and, and we don't have a dog in the fight. You know, we're not part of it. And I sort of thought that, that was great so that we could give 
obje our objective analysis on what we'd heard. But I also thought, it, are we cowards? That there they are, you know, fighting this stuff out that matters. And we're not, you know, we just go, uh, pff, a plague on all your houses, which is a slightly uh, what we do. And I, so I kind of was always keen that political journalism shouldn't be cynical. Um, it, we, sh we should be sceptical, certainly, but we should be trying to understand what they're doing. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess with your role in political journalism, you've had to cover people all across the spectrum. So in, in British politics, you've interviewed leaders of both parties, you've been to both party conferences. Um, one thing we share in common is, is I decided to go to both party conferences as well, and I couldn't help but feel cynical. So how do you kind of get out of your cynicism? And how do you actually, um, I guess, realise that these people do have a vision? What, what keeps you and the, the, inspired? The, I mean, one of, the, one, of the, one of the really difficult issues that you wrestle with as a political journalist, and I was a lob in the lobby at Westminster for 10 years, and, uh, and most recently I spent the last seven years you know, covering the White House, is the better you get to know a politician, the more they're going to tell you. And the more they tell you, the less they want you to report. In a kind of kind of, so they'll tell you confidences. Now, my broad view on life is, if you want to keep a secret, don't tell a journalist. <laughs> my job is not the keeping of secrets. <laughs> my job is to disseminate information as, as much as possible so that people kind of think, oh, I didn't know that, you know. But you get yourself in a position where you become, suddenly become mates with a politician. This happened to me during the Blair era, um, where someone says something to you and you think, blimey, that's interesting, wow. Can I report that? And you report it. And then all hell breaks loose. And, and, I, and I, I still don't know what is the really good way to navigate that, because how do you retain... We do not have the same interests. So the politician and the journalist have different jobs to do. I am not a press officer for Boris Johnson or Keir Starmer or Ed Davey or Nicola Sturgeon or whoever it happens to be. You know, and so I, got, I took a lot of stick um, on social media uh, from, the, you know, from Donald Trump supporters about you're just anti-Trump and you're just this and you're just that, um, you know, covering the four years of the Trump presidency. Um, we're holding power to account. That's the nature of the job. And when, so when Biden became president and I wrote these really stinky articles about how rubbish he'd been over the withdrawal of, from Afghanistan, people, the Trump people were saying, well, you wanted him elected. No, I didn't want anyone elected. But when someone does something good, I'll say, well, that was good. And when so do someone does something that is egregious and mishandled and terrible, I will also say that. And I think that's what we've um, got to do. And, and, it, and it's not good enough. I'm going into journalism ethics now. Just tell me if this is getting boring. It's just not good enough for us to say on the one hand, on the other. Some people say it's raining. Some people say it's not. Well, just go outside the bloody door and see if it's raining or not. That's the best way to find out if it's raining. You know, some people say two plus two is four. Some people say two plus two is six. Only time will tell. No, time won't tell. We know it's... And so I kind of think that you know, it's really important that at times we have to call things out. You know, Boris Johnson last night, this is a triumphant result. No, it's not a triumphant result. You know, nearly 150 backbenchers wanted you gone. Um, that is a bad result. I mean, he may limp on, he, you know, he may soldier on. I mean, I don't blame him for saying it. What else is he going to say? I'm hold below the waterline. No, he's not going to go on. But, but our job is to analyse what has happened um, and, and to make that sort of stuff clear. Yeah, I mean, you were saying that there's, there's some things you've seen that are good and some things you've seen that are absolutely egregious. Um, you've obviously spent a lot of your career in North America. Um, you've looked at sort of three, I think, different presidents come in and out. Um, you were at the front lines of Hurricane Katrina. Um, you, you've really seen a lot unfold. Um, what, do you, what do you think about the state of affairs in America right now? Do you think, as some people say, democracy is dead? 
No, I don't think democracy is dead. I, I'm deeply troubled. I mean, I was, I was uh, in Washington, D.C. on January the 6th, uh, when the capital uh, was invaded and there was an attempted insurrection. And when I went on the 10 o'clock news on BBC One that night, and the mob was still in control of the Congress, and Joe Biden's result as the election winner had not been certified, it seemed to me that that was a pretty precarious moment for the shining city on the hill of America, um, this great beacon of democracy. Um, and I am fearful, if, if you look at the numbers now, there are still something like, it's gone down, but something like 60% of people who voted Republican at the last election believe that the election was stolen. Let me just give a little rider to that. The election was not stolen. On every objective criteria, Joe Biden won. The results were certified by the 50 secretaries of state in each of the states. The head of election security that had been appointed by Donald Trump said it was a free and fair election and the safest in American history. The Attorney General, again, deeply conservative, William Barr, who had been appointed by Donald Trump, said there was no fraud. There were 63 cases that the Trump campaign brought before the courts to challenge the results. 62 of those cases were thrown out completely. One case about access to the vote, the counting in Philadelphia was a marginal victory for the Trump campaign, but it was only about whether the, they should have been allowed to, wit Trump supporters should have been allowed to witness the counting. There was no evidence. Yet we are in America today, something like 60% of Republicans who voted for Trump believe the election was stolen. Let's say that's exaggerated. Let's say it's only 50%. That is still 37 million adult Americans believe that a fraud has been perpetuated and that Joe Biden shouldn't be there. Now you can argue that Joe Biden shouldn't be there because he's not good enough, that his ideas are crap, that he's an old man, which he is, and that he's passed his sell-by date, which he also probably is, but you can't say he didn't win the election. And so I do fear for Amer American democracy when you've got so many people who have bought into a falsehood perpetuated by Donald Trump that the election was stolen. And what was fascinating in those weeks in America was on Capitol Hill, you'd go and speak to Republican congressmen who voted against certifying Joe Biden's victory. And they go, well, I mean, of course we know. We know that Biden won. But we just don't want to incur the wrath of Donald Trump. So we're going to say Biden didn't win. And you just thought, this is crazy. Where is your backbone? Because everyone was terrified that if they didn't do that, then Donald Trump would mount a campaign against them. There'd be abuse on social media, but that would be the least of it. It would be the fact that Donald Trump, with sackloads of money, would run primary campaigns against the congressman or congresswoman or the senator for wherever, and that they would find their political careers ruined by Donald Trump. You know, Donald Trump worked on Machiavelli's principle that it is better to be feared than loved. And, you know, Donald Trump liked to be loved as well, actually. And so it was, it was a, I, I do think it is a precarious time um, for US democracy, and we've got the whole kind of prospect of what happens in 2024. We've got the midterm elections coming up in November, when it, it will be surprising, if, if astonishing, if the Republicans didn't take control of the House, probably the Senate as well. Um, so, and then, you know, what happens in the next election? What happens if, I, I think if Trump, I mean, it's a very, really interesting question. I, you know, I'm, I, I have no greater insight than anyone else about whether Trump will run or not run. I, I mean, although he's giving every indication that he will, for a whole pile of complicated reasons, I, I 
think ultimately he probably won't. Interesting opinion. Um, so you, like you said, with, with sort of the Trump era, I guess America's historically been polarized for quite a while now, but the Trump era, I guess, exacerbated that to where you had people on one hand that refused to you know, think that Biden was a legitimately elected leader. And on the other hand, um, you had people during the Trump presidency who, who refused to see themselves as American. And indeed, I think that created a deep divide within the general populace of America. Do you think journalists perpetuate uh, political polarization? That's a good question. I think that, so, so you know, go back to your, kind of almost your, your starting point in this conversation. Um, and I was saying, I'm not cynical about politicians. I'm skeptical. And I think our job is to hold speak truth to power. I mean, I had this very, Donald Trump's first news conference as president, uh, which was a pretty testy and feisty affair. And, uh, and I put my hand up and, I, and I've uttered barely a syllable. He goes, where are you from? And I go, oh, uh, BBC News, another beauty. And I go, well, actually, and I thought, you know what? I'm gonna be really polite but I'm going to be really firm and say, actually, we're you know, free, fair and impartial. He goes, what, like CNN? And, and, and it kind of went on, we're bantering back and forth. I, but a lot of American journalists decided in, that they wanted to either be the cheerleaders for Donald Trump or they wanted to be, bring him down. And I just felt that the polarisation of the American media particularly on television, which is something we don't have in the UK because of the rules of Ofcom requiring impartiality, that channels like CNN, which I had seen when I moved to America in 2014, I kind of thought of CNN as a bit like the BBC, to be honest, broadly a bit liberal, um, but broadly speaking, the same values. As time went on, there was an instinct to be anti-Trump and then it became a business model. Who can be the most anti-Trump? And so you'd have news anchors. I mean, there was a guy called Don Lemon and I remember watching some rally that Trump had given in, in the Deep South. And it cuts back to, into the studio of Don Lemon, who is their main late, night, late evening anchor. And he goes, he's just going, What an embarrassment. I mean, what a disgrace. How awful that he's our president. Now, by all means, invite a guest who's going to say Donald Trump's an embarrassment and a disgrace or whatever. But when the news anchor is doing that, I mean, you know, can you imagine Hugh Edwards doing that on the 10 o'clock news or, or Fiona Bruce? I mean, we'd be fired instantly, rightly. Um, and I, so I kind of think that American media became almost a parody of itself, that there was some great journalism being done on the Washington Post, on the New York Times, and investigations by, but you know, Fox News was going out of its way to be the most pro-Trump, although it was then outflanked by Newsmax and One American News Network. And then you had MSNBC and CNN going the other way to be the most anti-Trump. And I just think, I think in a newspaper, it is easier to delineate what is news and what is comment. You have a big banner saying, this is the news pages, and then you turn to the center pages and it's comment, or it's the Sun Says, or it's the Daily Mail editorial, whatever it happens to be. I think on TV, it's really difficult. And so when people can't distinguish what is comment and what is news, then I think it's really bad, and I think that adds to the polarization. Um, Actually, can I just go back to one thing on January the 6th? I, I, I did a live the day, I, I, was, I went live on the 6 o'clock news the day after January the 6th. Um, so on January the 6th, I'd said on the 10 o'clock news that I think that American democracy is in a precarious place. And I kind of, and I said on there, I never thought I would utter that sentence and it not be hyperbole, but I don't believe it is hyperbole. And then the next day I went to, um, I was as, got as close to the capital as you could because there are now barriers that have been erected. And there is, the, there is a, a mob of Trump supporters that are still obviously in DC. 
and they start heckling me during this live that I'm doing with Sophie Rayworth on the six o'clock news. And I'm aware of these group of guys who are shouting at me, you lost, go home, you lost, go home, all the way through my life. <clears throat> And at the end of it, I said, you know, guys, look, I'm, I've got first, I'm, you know, I'm exercising my rights under the First Amendment to speak. So it's not that cool to kind of be interrupting. But what do you mean you lost? I, don't, I, I thought they meant, you know, that I was, a, uh, I was a supporter of Biden who lost and I should go. I mean, I didn't know what they meant. I said, what does it mean? And this guy just jabbed me in the chest and said, 1776. And I thought, oh my God, <laughs> oh my God, I am, I am being held responsible for George III, the redcoat, are you kidding me? <clears throat> and I, I thought, should I to explain that, you know, probably in 1776, my ancestors were Polish peasant, farming peasants. I thought, no, it would just complicate the picture too much. And I went, oh. I mean, f fair enough to you. Um, so you were sort of saying uh, between CNN and MSNBC and uh, something like Fox <coughs> News, yeah. there, there is in fact direct narratives that may be trying to be perpetuated. Um, do you think that British media and British journalism is going down the same sort of landscape? So for instance, you have um, GB News now and Navarro Media and maybe to a lesser extent, but they are uh, clearly politically motivated and um, sort of follow one political party or ideology as opposed to being uh, more bipartisan? I think a bit, but I don't think anything like to the same extent. And if you, I kind of, <laughs> I kind of reflecting a bit on, I mean, we had the Jubilee, the wonders of the Jubilee weekend. Um, and a nation really did, seem to come together and you know because of the queen and the the respect in which she held but also i think british people found that they had an awful lot that still glued them together whereas in america it's hard to find much that glues the american people together and i think the media have played a, a part in that social media has obviously played a huge part in that um, I think that British television, I mean, it's interesting that there's been huge fanfare for the launch of uh, Piers Morgan's, you know, Uncensored on Talk TV, um, that it's going to be hard hitting and it's going to be anti-woke and it's going to be this. And it's, it is all of those things, but it's not getting much of an audience. And I wonder whether that is because Britain, I mean, during Brexit, we had our moments. But if you look at America today, whether it's, abortion rights, which, you know, goodness knows what's going to happen there with Roe versus Wade. Gun rights and probably the forlorn attempts after Uvalde to, of Biden to try and get some change in gun laws. Um, Covid policy, mask wearing, you name it. We just do not have those divisions here. I mean, yeah, OK, there are people that were anti wearing masks in this country. In America, you were three times more likely to die of COVID if you lived in a county that strongly supported Trump than if you were in a county that supported Biden. I do not believe you could go around British constituencies, parliamentary constituencies, and find that vaccine take-up was party political. It was in the US. So, in America, you can divide on anything and everything. And I happen to believe that for all the flaws of British liberal democracy, we're still broadly in, a, in the right place. That power is changing hands, media is doing a decent job. And I, but I think that the media has I mean, you know, I've spent 38 years thereabouts in the BBC, and I've just left. Um, and I'm going to start a new project with Emily Maitlis, and we're going to do this daily news podcast. But I don't think that I've never th felt there has been a more important time to be a journalist, because I think there is so much fake news out there, falsehood, disinformation, some of it put out malevolently by, you know, by the by Russian bot farms, by whatever it is, 
that is just vile and leading people and it's populating people's Facebook feeds or wherever they get their social media from and the social media companies are struggling to keep up with it. <coughs> the impartial, balanced, fair journalism as practiced by the BBC, as practiced by ITV, as practiced by Sky News, as practiced by Global Media, which is where I'm going to be employed by soon, who run LBC and Capital and all those other radio stations, I think is really bloody important. And it's not for me to go and tell people whether to vote for Brexit or Remain or for the Conservatives or Labour or for Scottish Independence or whatever it happens to be. It's not my job. But it is my job to ensure that when people go into a polling station, they are making their judgments on good information and not bullshit. And I really think that that means that we have got the job of our lives. I, th I don't think it's going to be easy, but I, I, you know, when I just hear people telling me stuff as though it's a tablet handed down by God that is total nonsense, and you kind of wonder where that nonsense came from, I find that a bit frightening. Yeah, I mean, uh, as you should. Um, so let's let's hop on to sort of the the big topic that's been uh, pervading the media sphere, which is, um, I guess, the culture war and this idea of free speech. Um, you've touched about on um, sort of fake news circulating around and the detrimental impact that that can have. Um, do you think that uh, big tech companies um, like Twitter should police social media contact? and fact check said content um, or do you think that kind of goes against um, free speech it, is free speech an absolute I'd be interested to hear your views i don't think it, i don't think there it is an absolute you can't go into a crowded cinema and shout fire there is hate speech there are things that are legislated against and it seemed to me that America could have allowed free speech to reign, but then there may have well have been an insurrection and American democracy may have been turned over in the process. There was... I, 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 I don't think people fully appreciate how, how close America came in the last presidential election to there being a coup and, a, you know, and that, that was close. So if you say, well, you, you, it's just free speech to say that the election was stolen. And I had big battles with BBC bosses over how, what the tone of our coverage should be. Because they would say things like, well, Donald Trump has again repeated his claim that uh, the election was stolen. Full stop. No, it can't be full stop. It surely has to be comma, despite there being no proof, or whatever you, however you wanted to phrase it. Um, you can't just allow a falsehood to take hold because someone keeps repeating it. <clears throat> so I think that the social media companies do have a responsibility. I mean, do we say, <clears throat> when England lose, the Euros in a penalty shootout, that it's fine to just rip the shit out of Marcus Rashford and whoever else, because that's free speech. I think there have to be limits, and I think the social media companies have to ha exercise some sort of... Uh, control is probably too pejorative a word to use, but do have to have, accept that they have a responsibility for what is put onto their platform. And I think that it's complicated, and I think that it's difficult, but I think that anarchy lies awaiting you, or disorder maybe is a better word, if you don't. And it will be exploited, the free speech will be exploited by people, bad actors who want to do harm. And I think there has to be some kind of... Uh, and I, I say that as someone who I, I, I like, I believe in free speech. I believe in the free trading of ideas. I think that, you know, if universities start saying, well, we're not going to allow this one to speak or that one to speak, I think that's kind of worrying. 
because I think that people are intelligent and can make up their own minds. But when misinformation and disinformation is kind of allowed to run wild, I was, I'll go back to the 2016 election, and there was this theory that started on the outer reaches and the darkest recesses of the web about a paedophile ring in, in the Democratic Party. And it, and it was this idea that there was a paedophile ring by Hillary Clinton's chief of staff, John Podesta, and by Hillary Clinton, that all focused on a pizza restaurant in northwest Washington where children were being locked up and served up uh, for this paedophile ring. And it was just... But then it, it migrated from the outer reaches of the internet to uh, Reddit, and then one or two politicians, who should have known better, decided that they would say, well, there are, there are reports of a paedophile ring involving the Democrats. Uh, and that obviously gets it more. And now this far-fetched idea is migrating slowly into the mainstream. And you can say, well, it's all nonsense, and everyone knows it's nonsense, except for the day that a guy has driven up from North Carolina with a loaded AR-15 assault rifle, fires a high-velocity round into the ground. Luckily, there was no one injured by the ricochet. And says, I've come to free the children from the basement. Well, apart from the fact that the restaurant didn't have a basement, the theory was great. It was just absolute nonsense. And that became the basis for QAnon that people started believing that, you know, that, that there was this kind of paedophile ring that was at the heart of Washington, that was in the deep state. This stuff has to be challenged for the nonsense that it is. And I think that there is a failure of responsibility by the social media companies to say, oh, we're not publishers, we're only, we're only a platform. And I think that, therefore, they, they, it's something that has to be dealt with. Now, you know, and there are all sorts of ways that people far cleverer than me, but I mean, I was talking to the former chief executive of uh, Google uh, the other day at a conference, Eric Schmidt, and he was saying, look, you know, there's amplification. There's stuff that you do that you just don't, have, if you st stopped amplifying, um, but unfortunately, while you've got algorithms, that are going to pump more and more extreme stuff to people because they've shown a predilection for that, then the problem remains. And I think it's a serious problem. I really do. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we spoke a little bit about polarization earlier. Um, one of the other places that I guess you've been a correspondent and I guess gotten to take on the political landscape is in Paris. Um, so you spent three years um, as BBC's Paris correspondent, um, and this was obviously about 20 years ago, um, but what do you make of the uh, political landscape in France today um, and sort of the Le Pen-Macron situation where we see extremism on the rise? Um, do you think this sort of is going in the direction of America where we see republicanism and right-wingism on the rise, or, or do you think France and Paris is something else completely? Well, I... So when, the period when I was in Paris was when uh, Marine Le Pen's father, Jean-Marie Le Pen, uh, ran for the presidency. Um, and it was Chirac, who was the current president, and Nicolas Sarkozy, who was on the left. And it was going to be a right-left split in politics. You know, it would be in the second round of voting for the French presidential election. It would be either Chirac or it would be Sarkozy and, um, not Sarkozy, um, Jospin, Lionel Jospin, sorry. And, and in the end, it, you know, Jean-Marie Le Pen got into the second round. Now, okay, Chirac won overwhelmingly, but the rise of the Front National, although it's been rebranded and retouched and it's got softer, kind of more, kind of a bit more Vaseline around the lens, um, it, so it's a bit more soft focus, uh, has been rising. But I mean, the remarkable thing is how turbulent politics is. And I, in, in a way, a lot of people saw Macron's victory, rigid, the last first time round, as being the kind of counterweight, look, populism isn't taken over. 
Macron has won the election. Actually, it was extraordinary that Macron won. A new political party, a young guy at the head of it, he eviscerated the left and the right. Um, so I think that the political tides are shifting, um, but populism is, has a visceral appeal, um, and I think that mainstream politics has to learn how to counter it, and it's part of what I was talking about, about social media and about, you know, falsehood and misinformation, where everyone believes the easy kind of, there's, the, you know, there's a promised land and you can just promise easy things and people will buy into it. And I think journalism has a very big job to hold you, people to account for those sort of, putting forward those sort of policies. Um, I think that France did not vote for Marine Le Pen. Um, that Macron actually did rather better than some of the, you know, there were people saying it was going to be wafer thin tight. Uh, Macron has turned out to be an astute politician. And so I kind of, if you look around, okay, you, Europe today, you, okay, yeah, there's Orban. Um, is Boris Johnson a populist? Discuss. And yet there, there are elements of populism about him, but he's also been absolutely rock solid on Ukraine. I mean, you know, before that he was pretty rock solid at COP26 on environment policies. <coughs> I think it's hard to... I know that a lot of people draw parallels between him and Trump. I think there are actually, there's an awful lot of differences as well. Yeah. If we zoom out on your career, you said yourself that journalism is not easy. Um, so, question for me would be, uh, what's been your hardest story to report on? God, what's the hardest story? Um, it depends how you define hard. I, I think Trump was the most exhausting and exhilarating story uh, that I reported on. Uh, in the sense that you had to get the balance right and you couldn't just go into cliché. It it's easy to make people laugh about Donald Trump. You know, he, he, he was just the gift that kept on giving. And it, it felt like every night, every morning, I was on the television, on the radio, um, talking about, oh, you'll never guess what he said today. And, and there was, and there was some, sort of some fun to be had. But you had to take him seriously as well and so I, I felt that and also if you just went on television every night saying liar liar pants on fire he's done it again people would stop listening and you would only give a very monochrome kind of view of Trump and so I found it I found it intellectually really you know from the first day when his press secretary Sean Spicer gave that briefing and I was at it the, the White House saying, you know, the, tr the crowd for Donald Trump's inauguration was the biggest in US history, period. You know, no, it wasn't. Barack Obama's first inauguration in 2009 was bigger because you can just compare the photos taken from the Washington Monument looking towards the Capitol and you can see that there were hundreds of thousands more people there for Obama. And, you, and so your first kind of, in your first day of the Trump presidency, you're trying to d decide, am I going to say that's a lie? Well, yeah, I'm afraid we have to say that's not true. Um, and then you kind of get the, the whole stuff about, you know, him paying off a porn star and all that sort of stuff that came out. So it was that was challenging. Um, the, the, the stories that I hated, absolutely hated without any, although it meant I was the lead on the bulletin, uh, which is if you're a journalist, you want to be the lead on a bulletin. All the bloody gun shoot, you know, all the shootings. I, c I can list all the, the, the horrible, you know, the town. There are certain towns now to me in America that just mean mass killings because I went to cover, report on mass killings there. And there is just something, it's just so hopeless because you just feel that here we go again and you get the presenter in London saying to you, well, we're joined on the line now by John Sopel. John, surely after this, there's going to be a change in the gun laws. Nope, there isn't. Sorry, Second Amendment is not going to change. Move on. You know, you might ask why, but <coughs> don't assume. Um, and, I, and I found that very hard. 
um, and when children were involved, or, or parishioners. I mean, you know, there was the, the, the shooting in, in South Carolina in Charleston at the AME church, and you just thought, they were a bunch of black people who was, were going for their Bible study group and they're killed by a white supremacist and all they've done is been at a Bible study group. Or the Parkland kids in Florida, very similar to Uvalde um, now, um, you know, getting attacked. And you just think, what is this all about? And I, I, I really think that I, I understand the reasons why America feels the need to bear arms and have the right to, but I think that it's crazy that you can be 18 and buy an assault rifle with as much ammunition as you could possibly want, but you can't buy a pint of beer. You've got to be 21 before you can have a beer, but you can have a gun much younger. Yeah, no, it's, it's really strange. And I'm surprised, despite all of this, you haven't developed you know, more cynicism. But I guess on a more hopeful note, um, I, I used to be a student journalist in Oxford, and I've noticed there's a lot of student journalists sat in, in the benches. You've obviously had an illustrious career in, in real life journalism, but if there is one piece of advice you could give to the students who are looking to embark on perhaps, you know, maybe even a fraction of a successful career as yours, uh, what would you say to them now? Oh my God. Um, don't listen to old farts like me. That would be my <laughs> principal piece of advice. Um, be tough, be resilient. Uh, you're going to bounce back, you're going to have setbacks. And I suppose, my, I suppose the one thing I'd say is, <coughs> it's, and it's the old saying, if you want to make God laugh, tell him you've got a plan. And uh, we can all plan, right, in five years I want to be doing this, in eight years I want to be doing that, in ten years I want to be doing that. Opportunities come along at very odd, inconvenient times. You get asked to do things when you think, oh God, I, oh shit, I'm not, I can't do that tonight, but I'm, or next week, or whatever. I think that you've got to be flexible. And if something seems good, excuse me, my phone is barking at me. Um, if something good comes along, take it. I kind of, I, you know, and, I, and there, was a, there was a very great piece of advice that one of my colleagues gave me about a career in the BBC, but I think it ap applies to other careers as well, which is the Chinese proverb that if you stand on the edge of the riverbank long enough, the body of your enemy will eventually float past. There are times in your career where you're going to find yourself blocked and you're going to find you're, you feel trapped and that you can't do anything. And then the person who's been blocking you is taken out of the picture and suddenly, and so I think that you need some patience as well. Um, but journalism requires determination. It requires cheek. It requires uh, a certain kind of self-belief. Um, and if you're going into broadcast journalism and doing the job that you're doing now with me, which is, I think a lot of people think, I can speak out loud and I can form sentences when I speak out loud. Therefore, I'm a good broadcaster. And actually, I think, I know if I was to just stereotype slightly, I think this applies particularly to blokes. Uh, but we kind of, when you're broadcasting, you're not just on transmit. The best, the best interviews I've done with people, sometimes in very in harrowing circumstances, you know, in the middle of a war zone or a disaster area, you've got to be able to listen and listen to what people are telling you. And I think that the, the ability to receive information is a really key part of being a good communicator. And so you kind of think, oh, that's interesting, I didn't know that. And although you might have a question there written down that, that's your next question, screw that, I'm jacking, I'm, I'm getting rid of the whole interview structure because someone just said, something really interesting to me and I want to know more about it. Yeah, I mean, la last question before I open up to audience questions. You were saying opportunities arise at, at strange times. Um, we were talking outside about how um, there was the opportunity to replace Laura Koonsberg recently. Um, and that's something that, that you didn't go for, but you've got, of course, exciting work planned. Um, Why did you make that decision and kind of what does the future have in store? Um, well, I was, I was 
it was very flattering that the BBC wanted, when I was coming back from Washington, they said, suggested, you know, I was asked, would I take over from Laura? And uh, it was very flattering. And I'd, I thought about it for a while. Um, and I thought, I've done this for a long time. I thought a bit that I kind of don't think that Westminster politics, I'd done 10 years at Westminster. And when you've done politics in Washington, where it really does seem big and powerful, and you've been on Air Force One with the president, I'm not sure what I felt about doing the Transport Select Committee <laughs> at Westminster. <laughs> Just kind of, and the thought of having to get to know, because it's, it's a long, term, long time since I was in the lobby, of having to suck up to 26-year-old spads, just thought, oh my God, I can't do that. Then there was the kind of abuse on social media that I just thought, oh, do I really want that? Um, and then there were bits about life in the BBC, which I thought, you know what, I've, I've done my stint. And, and really, it's the, the, the glory of what I was doing in Washington was that the 10 o'clock news is on at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. At 5.30 in the afternoon, no matter what is happening, the evening is yours. So I would go and arrange to see people for dinner and I would actually turn up. Whereas my whole life, uh, whereas, you know, at Westminster, you, you, you would be on the Today programme at 6.30 in the morning and you'd be still doing the 10 o'clock news at 10.30 at night and then you'd have to write your blog and you'd get to bed at midnight and you'd do the whole thing again the next day. Um, and I just thought that I'm, I wasn't convinced I was really committed to being political editor. So I was very flattered to be asked and then this counter offer came along, which just seemed, and I kind of, the thing that I have done over the past two years, which has been the prof professionally the most satisfying, is doing this podcast with Emily Maitlis called AmeriCast, and we're now going to be doing a daily news podcast, and it just seemed a really exciting offer. So we may fall flat on our face, and you know, you'll see me outside Oxford Railway Station with a red plastic cup shaking it for a few pennies, but hopefully it'll be okay. Yeah, hopefully it will be okay. Well, best of luck to you. Um, and with that, I'd like to open up to audience questions. So if anyone's got a question, feel free to raise your hand. Um, let's start with uh, the women in the front, the green plates here. Thank you, Anvi, and thank you very much, John, for coming along. It's really interesting to, I, I listened to your talk last year, um, the, your, your virtual talk, and to hear a bit about how your answers have changed. I'm one of the wannabe journalists to whom Anne B referred earlier. I, I'm interested in how you think that your strategy, as whether as an interviewer or as a reporter, has had to adapt in recent years, and whether you think there's been any particular turning point in how you have had to question politicians. Have you had to change the way you do that? Have they become more evasive? How have you adapted your techniques? Well, I, I think that certainly it's true that politicians have been schooled? That's a very interesting question, but I think what's the main issue here is why the government has been so successful. No, 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 I didn't ask you that. You know, come back, come back, come back. So, so I kind of think that, you, yeah, you've got to be uh, more persistent in getting answers to your question. Um, I don't think broadly strategy has changed. I, I, I kind of think that sometimes politicians, the, the we journalists, ask rather predictable questions. When are you going to resign? Well, should you resign? They're going to say, no, I've done nothing. If you ask more, go on a tangent. Go and say, what do you think is a resigning issue for a minister? That's a much more uncomfortable question to ask because then they don't know where to go, because they, they know you're asking about them, but you're asking a much more general question. And so I think you've got to be clever. I think you've got to ask interesting questions. Um, and again, that's the part of what I was saying, is you've got to listen as well. But I mean, you know, the, the uh, kind of uh, Gordon Brown, I mean, when he was prime minister, oh my God. Was there a bigger nightmare person to interview than him? Because it was like a tank rolling towards you, and no matter what you said, you know, so the weather's nice. Well, the government's economic policy is showing great dividends, and <laughs> yeah, you know, how, how the kids? Well, the government's economic policy is showing great dividends, and we are, you know, and it was, and it's just hopeless. Um, 
I, I, so I think that, you know, and I tend not to like gotcha questions, you know. So how much is a pint of milk? How much have you paid for a litre of uh, petrol? Um, I mean, occasionally that can be justified. But I think that we've got, you've just got to be smart. And, and there are some politicians who engage, who've got the intellectual self-confidence. And there are some who cover up their insecurity by just becoming very aggressive and repeating the same things. Um, I think pod, that's why I think podcasting is interesting. Because it's not a three-minute interview, four questions, five questions. You've got the time to be expansive and to take it into areas where you think, oh, that's revealing. Uh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. And so I think that that's why, kind of one of the reasons why I, I want to do podcasting. But good luck with your embryonic journalistic career. And I, 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 say, I meant what I say. Honestly, I've been doing this for bloody decades now. And I really think that now, today, 2022, there has never been a more important time to be going into journalism. So, you know, good luck to you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for your question. Um, anyone else with questions? Uh, I recognise <coughs> gentlemen on, on my right. Uh, thank you. So you said earlier about the problem of uh, the public becoming more polarised um, and partly uh, that being because of people's cynicism towards politicians. Um, how do you think the media can help with that as, I mean, usually balanced and fair articles are going to be, have far less catchy headlines than some of these uh, populist mouthpieces? And why do you think Britain has um, done perhaps somewhat better than the States and other countries in this? Okay, two parts to that. One is um, the kind of constitutional furniture, if you like, which is that, you know, Ofcom here has, there was the Federal Communications, some, the FCC, which they, 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 had a, they had a strategy of fairness and that was got rid of during the Reagan era. And so that's when America, that, which paved the way for Fox and to have a much more partisan TV. So, so America abandoned any sense that their journalism had to be impartial. Um, so that's one of the reasons why. Um, I also think that there is a kind of sense that, I would challenge the basis of the first part of your question, which is that you, unless you're being populist, or extreme, you can't be interesting. I still think that I can be cheeky, I can be mischievous, I can be provocative, and still, I mean, I kind of, I said to my bosses when I was at the BBC, you know, the impar impartiality is not a sign of blandness, it's not about being wishy-washy, I think it's got to be muscular. I really believe in kind of muscular, impartiality or aggressive impartiality that where we do you know we do make people think and we do make people and we are provocative or we are we are cheeky we, we're there to cause trouble i'm not there as i said to be an adjunct to the press office of the labor party or the conservative party or any other party i'm there to ask cheeky questions i mean you know last night on social media i kind of thought you know um, you know i said it was also you know, it was cr crap for Boris. I also said, why is Keir Starmer doing this pointless statement when, you know, the old adage of politics is that if someone's committing suicide, there's no need to murder them. You know, the, and, and I, I, so I kind of think you can have a go at all sorts of people, but you, do, but you can still be... What I don't think journalists have got any right to be is boring and dull. We are saying to the public, look, I know you could be doing something else now. I know you've, you're busy, you've got a life, you don't need to listen, watch me on the television, you could be doing something different. And, and they will do something different if you're boring. And so the one thing we don't have the right to be is dull. And I don't think that being impartial means you're dull. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, this may be the last audience question. Um, I recognise um, in the white tie-dye shirts, yes. Hi. Um, following on kind of from what you just said, sometimes when you're reading the news, especially on social media, it can kind of feel like 
social media and like news outlets have gone beyond interesting and just towards completely sensationalist and attacking everything anyone ever says ever um, and do you think the, the BBC have walked that line between being neutral and informative but still interesting and just being sensationalist for the sake of it to get views and clicks online? Look, we've, this is why I say it's the challenge of uh, my lifetime, the challenge of our generations, because it's much easier to be provocative, to poke people in the eye, to be offensive, to be obnoxious, to be whatever it happens to be. Um, that's easy. Anyone can do that, and they've got the means to self-publicise, and anyone could be a journalist now. They just say, I'm a journalist, and I'm doing this stuff. Uh, I think it's really tough, and I think that for news organisations like the BBC, we shouldn't be going down the clickbait route, but we've just got to have bloody good storytelling. And I, you know, I, when we did AmeriCast, Emily and I did AmeriCast, <coughs> the BBC bosses came to us and said, oh my God, you're getting a load of young people. We can't, we haven't been able to get young people. Well, the biggest rock star for young people in the BBC is David Attenborough, aged 93, 94 because the content is fantastic. And I just think that we have got to remember that if we produce good stuff, really good stuff, then people will watch, people will listen, people will read, and we mustn't go down the route of the lowest common denominator of just producing clickbait crap that might get people's eyes on it for a little while, but. And I, I do think there are kind of really complicated cross-currents that, you know, you'd say, well, the problem with young people today is they don't watch news bulletins anymore. And they, they only kind of, they look on their Facebook feed or whatever it happens to be on Instagram and they just look at the headline and then they move on. And yet podcasts are more popular than ever. So, whereas, which suggests that people really want to go into some depth in a subject and want to drill down. So I kind of think that there are cross-currents, but... I think we've just got to, I think the BBC and others, I keep, I, I'm so institutionalised, having been for so long in the BBC that I still talk about it as if I, I still work for it, I don't, um, that they've got to do what they've always done, that the values that, you know, even going back 100 years to Lord Reith when it was established, we've got to educate, entertain and inform and we've just got to do it better. And we've got to find, and you know, and I think through what's happening in Ukraine, through the pandemic, public service broadcasting has again and again shown its worth and its mettle because reliable information has come from that. And I think it's, you know, if uh, I. I think the BBC has had a good war in Ukraine, and I think ITV and Sky 2, and I think over the pandemic as well, where you're trying to give information that is sensible and balanced, and that is why we've done better than a lot of other societies. Because I think that for all the faults that we have got uh, in our broadcast, you know, in the faith that people have in journalists or broadcasting, we're still doing a reasonable job but we have got the fight of our life to, to be heard above all the crap. And I don't, I don't say it's going to be easy. We've just got to tell good stories well and not go down the route of, think, of the CNNs and the MSNBCs of just thinking if we go really extreme, we'll pick people up like that. I, I, I love Piers Morgan, but I'm not upset. That I think there is a limited appetite in this country uh, for people being shouted at. <laughs> um, thank you so much and thank you so much for your question um, with that I'm afraid we, we've run out of time but um, would everyone like to join me in thanking John Sober for his time this afternoon and, and for sharing his wisdom and insights thank you